All right, everybody, welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. My name is David Davis. I am the PIO for the CSEP program, uh, working out of Frankfort, Kentucky. Thank you for joining us today for our second Wednesday webinar. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but we are putting together these webinars to provide training for public information officers and other people in communication related fields. Uh, I hope that you enjoy them. We are not currently doing surveys uh, to kind of see how you guys like each one, but I am working on getting that done. Uh, but the most important thing to me is if you like them, let me know. If you have suggestions for topics and or speakers, please let me know and I will work on scheduling them. We do have all of our webinars booked through August already. So we are uh, getting quite a, quite a bit ahead. I do have registration open for March. Uh, I will share a link with that for that after uh, this webinar when I send up the, the follow up with the link to the recording as well. Uh, today's topic is going to be the critical first hour in emergency communications. It's not if, but when a crisis will happen. Managing that crisis successfully takes preparation and planning. In this webinar, we'll talk about ways to set yourself and your communications team up for success. You'll walk away with ideas for what to include or change in your crisis communications plan, ideas for integrating communications into existing training, checklists of what to do in the first hours of a crisis, and a cheat sheet of first hour holding statements. Our speaker today is Bronley Mischler. Bronley Mischler is a public relations and communications professional who owns Bronley M Consulting, a firm offering training and communication guidance to government agencies. Previously, Bronley spent more than a decade as a communication director and crisis communication expert for city and county governments in Washington state. Bronley managed social media for the 2014 uh, SR 530 landslide and coordinated communications for the 2014 Marysville Pilchuck High School shooting and 2016 Cascade Mall shooting. She has also served as lead spokesperson and communications manager for smaller jurisdictional emergencies and weather events. Bronley is a FEMA certified instructor for the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center for FEMA's Emergency Management Institute and for Argonne National Laboratory. Bronley has a Master of Education degree with a concentration in adult education. Bronley, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for presenting to us today. Yeah, and thank you, David, for the introduction. I'm excited to be here. Uh, fair warning. Yep, we've got about an hour and I am going to cover a lot of materials. So the good news is this is going to be recorded and saved on YouTube if you want to watch it later. And there is going to be a fair amount of thinking uh, and some participation. So hopefully you are all awake, either eating lunch, post lunch coma, and hopefully we can keep you awake here. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Don't mind my looking around. I'm at the office. I have three screens. It's magnificent. I can see everything all the time. <clears throat> All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, what we are going to talk about today is planning today for a crisis tomorrow. Tips for managing that first 60 minutes of a crisis. So as soon as I find my mouse, there it is. All right, so here are some of the things that we're gonna to plan to cover today. We will talk about anticipating the worst, uh, some plans, policies, and procedures to keep in mind, what to consider in that first hour, and then training for success. But before we get started, I want to hear from you. There has been a natural disaster in your area. Let's just assume there's been a natural disaster in your area right now, and you have been asked to support the communications response. How confident are you that you know what to do first? I'm going to ask you to either scan the QR code on the screen with your phone, or I'm going to drop a link in the chat, and I'll ask you to take my very quick one-question anonymous survey. How confident are are you that you know what to do first? Are you not confident, sort of confident, somewhat confident, completely confident? Give it a couple seconds for you to fill out that survey there. And I am coming to you from Washington State where it is still coffee time. So you may see me drinking my coffee throughout this. 
I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds for you to hit those poll questions, and I'll show you what you all said as a response. Bronley, while they are doing that, I will mention that I'll be monitoring chat. I know that you'll be monitoring chat. If anybody has a question throughout any of the presentation, feel free to enter it into chat, and we will make sure it gets answered. All right. That's about 10 seconds. So for all of you who are here who participated, most of you said you said you are fairly confident that you know what to do. And that's great. Some of you said slightly confident. Some of you said not confident at all. The goal is to move you up one notch on this confidence scale by the time we're done. And you will see this same survey again, except it'll be this little tab right here. So let's click on back over to our slideshow and we'll keep going. So there are times, uh, sometimes people will tell you, oh, it's not great to think about worst case scenarios, but sometimes it is good to think about those worst case scenarios. But first, what's a crisis? Now, this isn't a dictionary definition. It's just one that comes from my own personal experience. And a crisis encompasses a lot more than just a weather emergency, a car crash, or what you might typically think of as a crisis. And I will give you an example. This, this picture right here. A crisis can be literally anything. And this picture is from an anti-oil protest that shut down a rail line and two oil refineries a few years ago. So the agency I worked for at the time knew the protest was happening. The protesters had announced their intentions and we had an EOC and a JIC set up. So we were prepared. What we didn't plan for, even though we'd planned for arrests, was the garbage scandal. So as you can see here, these folks had camped on the railroad tracks. And when they were arrested, booked, and then released about 48 hours later, any personal items they left near the scene had been collected and taken to the county's dump. The protesters were understandably outraged, and that made the news. Not the protests, not any of the arrests, but what we did with their belongings. And that was the crisis we didn't anticipate. And this is why I tell you that sometimes a crisis is maybe not what you think it's going to be. And you're not going to be able to anticipate every crisis. We're not, you know, we don't have a crystal, crystal ball. But even with the help of AI, you're not going to think of everything. But if you remember nothing else from this, and I really can't stress this enough, successfully managing the first hour of any crisis starts before a crisis ever happens. Now, you are probably the expert. Aha, uh -huh. I'm not the expert in PowerPoint right now because I can't click a button. Um, but you are probably the expert in your communities on what could go wrong. You know the climate, you know the weather, you know the major businesses and industries, and the annual events in your area. So me personally, I live on an island in Washington state. It's more of a glorified peninsula, but island nonetheless. And we're at risk for some tsunamis, some coastal floodings, windstorms, the natural hazards. We're also potentially at risk for a refinery fire or explosion or a military plane crash because I'm one island over from a naval air station. Those are the man-made hazards that could happen. So throw in the chat, what's one common or natural man-made hazard in your area? First thing that comes to mind. What kind of weather, Robin? My weather's probably different than yours. We don't have tornadoes here. Yep. A lot of tornado. Uh, bourbon warehouse collapse. Good, good, good. I like something different. Car hits pole. Yep, we've had that. Earthquake, fire and earthquakes, tornadoes or high winds that don't meet the tornado thresholds, ice storm, train to work, natural gas. Yeah. So you already have a pretty solid list of what could affect your area right now. That's amazing. The other way you can think through what might happen, and some of you have probably already said this, is thinking at thinking about historic events in our area. So in Washington State, one of our historic events was Mount St. Helens. We hope that doesn't happen again, but we know we're at risk for volcanic eruptions. And those historic events really give us perspective on what has happened and what could potentially happen again. So some of your answers may be historic, but what is a major historic crisis event in your area? Maybe the train derailment was one of them, but what else? Ice storm 2009. 2006 tornado, okay. Oof, transmission water main break. That sounds pretty gnarly. 100-year flood. Major flood back in the 40s. Ice storm 2021 Kentucky. 
weather tornado or Western Kentucky tornado. All right. So you have a pretty good idea of, oh, the new Madrid fault earthquake. Yes. It's always interesting for us out here where we have 7,000 fault lines to realize that those earthquake fault lines still exist, even in the middle portion of the United States. So earthquake, that's a real issue potentially for you as well. So you have a pretty good handle on the events that are most likely to happen in your area, and that's good. And that is one of the first steps towards success during a crisis is really identifying what could go wrong in detail so that you can create or update your plans for communicating what has gone wrong. Now, it might seem like a lot to think about all the things that could go wrong, but don't panic. You got a preview of this because I scrolled too fast. The responsibility for thinking about all the things that could go wrong is not entirely on you because in many cases that research has already been done by somebody else. So throw in the chat for me, how many of you are or know your emergency management colleagues? Yes? No? I know my emergency manager for Island County. He's on the other island. I'm gratified to see a lot of yeses. This is good. It is okay if we see a no or maybe not that well, because that's one of the things we want to address in this. If you don't know your emergency management folks well, add that to your to-do list for the next week, the next quarter, because you want to know these folks before the emergency. You want to have that good relationship, and they might be able to help you with your emergency communications planning because their job, their department's job, is to create those plans that, among other things, identify risks and mitigation measures. So you can look at the alphabet soup here on the screen, but there are a lot of plans that may exist that you can get value from because a lot of the plans talk about what could go wrong. They can identify common hazards, threats, and risks, any mitigation or preparedness measures your agency has in place to address them. Reviewing these plans can help you update your list of, hey, what could go wrong? And it can give you some inspiration for, gosh, I didn't think about this as a risk or a hazard. We need to develop some emergency messaging for that. Uh, these plans may also tell you about designated shelter locations or evacuation routes. And knowing that in advance of a crisis helps you communicate more quickly and more effectively in a crisis. So rather than saying, evacuate your home and go to the nearest shelter, you can be more specific because you've already looked at these plans. You can say residents of, insert location here, should evacuate to, insert specific shelter here. Because you already know that information, you know where to find it in a crisis. You can also, if you feel motivated, create custom Google Maps with evacuation routes or shelter locations pre-planned and then you can stand those up, push them out to the community in a crisis so people have that visual of where am I and how do I get to my nearest shelter. The other thing you can do is look back at previous emergency communications you've put out, things that are dealing with ice storms, tornadoes, flooding, earthquakes, and figure out what did we say? What did we put in our social media posts? What did we put in our press releases? What did our JIC plan look like and who did we have there? Because that's a starting point for creating or refining your strategy knowing what needs to be in your JIC, knowing, hey, these are the posts we put out that were very effective. Perhaps that's something we can replicate, right? You may have already done the work. So rely on that as you're thinking about what you need to do in the future. Now, did we not just talk about plans? Technically, yes, we talked about emergency plans. What we're going to talk about now is those communications plans, policies, and procedures that will help guide you during a crisis. So if you came here expecting me in an hour to give you a magical formula that guarantees success in every emergency, I am going to apologize and disappoint you because I am not a magician and such magic formula does not exist. But there are some key elements that will get you set on the path to success regardless of what your crisis or emergency is. So at a bare minimum, when you are thinking about your agency's crisis communications planning and response, you need to know what communications or crisis communications plans you have and what's in them or what's not in them and should be. You need to know uh, what questions to ask about those plans, and we'll talk about that in a second. And I can see that uh, Kentucky Emergency Management does have a crisis comms guidance document that's going to be updated soon that can be shared with you. So that may be a great resource to help you build or expand on your plans. You also need to know who on your team is impacted by crisis communications or communications plan. And this may seem pretty obvious, but how do we implement? how do we implement the plan? So first and foremost, do you know, and you can give me a yes, no, or I'm not sure, does your agency have a dedicated emergency communications plan or an ESF-15 plan? That's your FEMA speak for emergency 
support function 15, which is external affairs, which is PIO GISTIC. Do you have an emergency comms or an ESF 15 plan? Yes, I like seeing all the yeses. It gives me joy. All right, so this is awesome. You guys are very much ahead of the curve. Having a plan is extremely important. Um, and if not, as Dave dropped in the chat, there is a guidance document that maybe can help serve as a sample plan. And if you don't have a plan, look at the folks who said yes here. Maybe you can use their plans to create a framework for your own. So every communications plan will look a little bit different because your agencies are a little different. But at a basic level, an emergency communications plan should outline how your agency expects to communicate during an emergency. It should talk about specific roles and responsibilities. It should include some org charts, some guidelines for how to conduct that initial communications response, recommendations for media briefings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And even if that plan is two pages, it helps you know who is supposed to do what, where, and when because trying to come up with that in the middle of the emergency is real stressful. So when you leave this webinar, there are a few questions that you should ask about your crisis communications plan. And if you're gonna frantically note take, now would be the time to do it, but don't worry, you can also rewatch this recording. So we'll go slow. So what communications plan does your agency have? How many of them do you have? Is there an emergency or a crisis communications plan or is it just a general communications plan? What department owns or updates those plans? Because if it's your department, then it's your responsibility. But if it's another department, you're going to want to figure out who that department is and who owns it so that you can work together to actually update or refine that plan. Uh, and when was it last updated? Because in many cases, your agency may have a crisis communications plan, but it may be from, oh, let's say 2010 or even older, because we now have social media. Right. And if you have an old crisis communications plan that doesn't take into account kind of the primacy of social media in sharing those communications messages, your plan's not going to be as useful as you think it's going to be. So know what you have and also when it was last updated. Does that plan clearly explain what you and your department's role is in communicating emergency information? When I worked for my previous agency, I was the communications person for the county. But I didn't realize that I was also the primary spokesperson for literally anything that happened in public works because they didn't have a communications person. So if there was a public works related emergency, that was me. If emergency management had an emergency, that was me. So knowing what you are going to be called on to do in an emergency is really critical. If there are specific responsibilities that you need to have, like whether that's drafting press releases, updating an emergency information page on your agency's website, or putting out specific emergency messaging, you want to know that in advance so that you can make sure that you anticipate it and have the training and knowledge and comfort and skill level to actually do it when the emergency hits. Now, does your plan identify which communications channels to use? That may also seem pretty basic, but if you have an agency that is running multiple Facebook pages or Instagram pages, or you are still using Twitter or X, because it is important for your community, how do you know which communications channel you're putting information out on first? You should identify that in a communications plan because it's going to save you time. Um, does the plan clearly identify what approval processes you need. Who actually approves those emergency messages, your staffing requests, other needs? That's something you don't want to have to fight with in the middle of an emergency is, well, I've got all this messaging, but I need somebody to prove it before I can put it out. And who notifies you of an emergency? When do you even start using this plan? There should be some documentation within that plan and some knowledge in your agency of you get a phone call, you get an email, you get a text message, or God forbid you have a cyber crisis, your internet and everything are knocked out, you have slow internet access or your cell phones aren't responding well, maybe you are dealing with landlines. How are you going to respond in that case? And then how can you take all of the documents that you've already created and have them adapted for analog? You know, are you literally printing things out and putting them on a bullet board rather than using these graphics on social media? You've got to be able to think of that because Sometimes we're going to have crises where power doesn't exist and all the channels you are comfortable using, those aren't going to exist either. And you need to think about how you're going to accommodate. And that might be a great little tabletop drill to talk through with your local PIO network. 
All right. It's also really important to know what your agency policies and procedures are when it comes to emergency communications. It's not enough to just have a plan and communicate about the emergency, but how does it work internally? Now, you may be a team of one. I was always a team of one. I'm still a team of one, at least at the agency where I currently work. But you may have access to other resources that you haven't thought about internally and externally that can support you in a crisis. So thinking internally, are there communication staffers in other departments, even if they don't directly report to you, who can help you listen on social media or craft communications? You know, is there a part-time communications person in public health or public works who can help support your overall emergency response? Those are the connections you need to make now and have those conversations. Do you have field personnel who can take and share photos? My last agency, they had flood spotters because we had a lot of riverine flooding and I certainly couldn't be everywhere and members of our JIC couldn't be everywhere, but we did have dedicated flood spotters in the field who were capable of taking pictures of water over roadways and road closure signs and texting those pictures to us. That's a force multiplier. That's content and situational awareness that you can leverage in an emergency, even if you don't do it yourself. Do you have frontline or customer service staff who can help you develop answers to common questions they've heard from residents in the past? Especially if you have longtime staff, they've probably been through a couple emergencies. They've probably answered the phones and they can tell you, hey, last time we had this, here are the questions that got given to us over the phone or here are the questions we responded to via email. That's great. Leverage that. You may even call on them to be uh, communications call takers in your emergency operations or emergency coordination center. So you may have more people in your agency than you think who can really help support your communications response. And cultivating those relationships now is going to be really beneficial because they have some anticipation and understanding that they may be needed in an emergency and specifically what they'll be needed to do. Now, externally, Dave told me that you have a regional PIO network and communications group, which is magnificent. Uh, that is one thing that we didn't have 10 years ago when we had our SR530 slide. And it was much harder to get warm bodies in our joint information center because we just didn't know who was out there and what they were doing. We have that now, and it's been a huge, huge benefit to us because we know our local PIOs, we know what their skill sets are, and we have a basic understanding that if something goes wrong in one of our communities, we're likely to be called upon to assist. That's a great stress reliever to me in times of crisis because I know I've got folks out there I can rely on. So Thinking about the people you have in those groups, what support can they provide during a crisis? What are their skill sets? Can they do graphic design? Can they do social media listening? Can you bring them into your joint information center to help manage press briefings or help coordinate all of the communications? Really think about who's there and what's going to be the most effective way for you to utilize those people. And then switching gears a bit, what methods other than social media do you use to do emergency information dissemination? Uh, we have is it code red? I think it's code red up here. So that's our reverse 911 opt-in alerting system. You may have Nixel, Everbridge, MyState, AlertSense. There are a whole lot of different providers, but you want to know what those providers are and then also who has access to send those alerts. And I say that because you don't want your 911 entity, let's say they're in charge of putting out reverse 911, you don't want reverse 911 messages going out that sound real different from your Facebook messages. So knowing who's actually putting out those opt-in alerts is important so that you can coordinate that message. You also want to have guidance within your plan that identifies that. Like, hey, here's how we coordinate. Here's how we do internal coordination for messaging. We make sure we send to our 911 partners what we're putting out on Facebook. 911 will send to us what, we're, what they're putting out via their opt-in alerts or what they're telling people when they call 911, right? And then we as as well, knowing who your alerting authorities are in your agency. For me here on, on Camino Island, our alerting authority is Island County Emergency Management on the next island. I'm literally pointing that way because it's literally over there. And our ICOM 911 Dispatch Center. And so if something rose to the level of a WIA, I would know who I would need to contact to get that information out. And then when it comes to actually communicating, you know, putting your fingers to the keys, getting those social media posts out there. You need to be specific in your plans and in your communications policies. How do you communicate with internal staff? Is it by phone? Is it by email? What's your backup plan if the power goes out? Are you notifying your internal staff before you notify the public? 
that can always be a little heartburn if your PIO group and your joint information center is focused on pushing emergency information out to the general public before they notify their internal staff of what's going on. So make sure you have accommodated for that and documented how you're going to do it in your plans. And then if you're thinking about your public communication methods, what's your primary communication method? What's the thing you use first? Is it your website? Is it your Facebook page? Is it the emergency management Facebook page? And does that change based on the type of emergency? Chances are it will, and you should write that down so that there's no confusion, so that whoever comes in to support you in an emergency, whether it's you or someone who is your backup, they know, hey, for these three types of emergencies, we use the county's or the city's Facebook page first. For these type of emergencies, we would defer to the sheriff's office or public works, right? Um, for these types of emergencies, maybe it's X or Twitter, right? Documenting that is really important so that you are consistent and there's no communications confusion as you're trying to get that message out. Uh, 911 as well, some of your call takers with that internal communications. It's also important to see, hey, what are people calling about, right? As you move forward through the crisis, understanding what people are asking will help you also refine the products you're putting out and having a documented procedure for how you collaborate with those internal partners who may be getting messaging is very important. And we've talked about what your primary platform are, if it, it is and if it changes, but who has access to that social media account? Who has access to those alerting platforms? And is it you? Is it somebody else? And who's the backup if you're unavailable? Because it always seems that 80% of the time when you have an emergency, it's Sunday at 9 p.m. People may be out of town, they may not be in the office, and if something happens that's catastrophic, they may not be able to get to a location. So it's all well and good to have all of your processes and procedures documented, but if nobody can actually implement the plan by logging into Facebook or accessing that alerting platform to send out the message, then you have a problem. And you should really think now, how do we document this? What do we need to do to make sure that regardless of the emergency, regardless of what's going on, we have a plan for getting information out quickly. All right, so a lot of you, I think most of you said, yeah, we've got a crisis communications plan. We have some emergency communications plan and that's amazing. And we just talked through a lot of questions that you wanna ask and coordination points you wanna consider. Onboarding some more coffee. So once you know what your communication plan says, there are a few things you want to consider adding or updating or including for the first time if you need to actually have an emergency and communicate. So roles and responsibilities, I would say, is the most important because you want to be really specific about what roles communications positions are going to fill in an emergency and what roles maybe non-communications people will fill to support that communications response. And I think it's important to focus on position titles, not individuals. So the communications director will do this, not Jane Smith. The uh, call taker for the commissioner's office will do this. And then be specific also not only about the positions, but what authority each position has. What types of tasks are they going to do? Do they supervise other people? Are they going to be in a position where they need to approve other people's work? Document that <clears throat> so that when, <clears throat> excuse me, so that when that crisis hits, there's clarity for everybody about what they need to do and who they need to supervise or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> thinking about access too. Be really clear about who can and should access specific social media accounts and agency web pages, whether that's at all times or whether that's just during an emergency. Are there specific positions in your joint information center or are there specific positions in your agency that need to have access to social media pages, agency emergency information websites, reverse 911, et cetera. Be very uh, clear and specific about who's gonna have access to that so that when the emergency comes, we know, yes, the JIC manager needs to have access to this. Yes, the internal communications lead needs to have access to this. Again, clarifying, eliminating stress and confusion during the actual crisis. Records retention is also maybe something that you haven't thought about. Um, 
how are you tracking and retaining all of the content and information that you have posted to social media and created for that emergency? We know emergencies run on forms, but forms are only half the battle. Obviously, you have to fill them out. But digital information needs to be retained as well. So what archiving do you have in place for your social media and your digital platforms? Is that archiving connected to all of the platforms and accounts you would be using in an emergency? Because if it's not, you may want to consider having that conversation about we need to record all of our social media content because in an emergency, this account could be used. And we don't want to have to go through the process of, hey, we're having an emergency. We just need to connect this account for a few days so that we can make sure we archive our data. It should be happening now. One less thing to worry about. And then finally, being very specific about approval processes. Who has that final authority for verifying and approving messaging? It may be very simple. It may be your joint information center manager, your JIC manager, but maybe it's a smaller emergency and it doesn't quite rise to the scale of needing to stand up a JIC. Who has approval then? What if it's a fire or law related emergency that you're supporting and you're supporting that communications response? Who do you need to get messaging approved by? Clarify that and write it down now so that when the emergency happens, it's as simple as going to a plan and saying, this position is my approving authority. Great. That's all I need to know. And then are any messages pre-approved? We'll talk about that in a little bit. What can you do now to create pre-written messages for those emergencies that you already talked about? You're anticipating your tornadoes, your ice storms, your flooding, your earthquake. Can you have pre-approved fill-in-the-blank messaging that is good to go just so long as you add time, date, place, or place, you know, place, duration, et cetera? That's going to save you time too, but you need to have it written into your plan. What are our pre-approved messages? Where do they live? And then what's our process for reviewing and updating them quarterly, semi-annually, et cetera? Now, bringing it down to a little bit finer point, what do you want to think about in the first hour? So those of you who have worked in emergency know that that first hour can be really, really frantic. But having a checklist, having some prepared, pre-approved holding statements can help you respond a lot more quickly. So it helps to have a checklist, a first hour emergency checklist. And I'm going to put a link in the chat. It is a bit.ly link. It goes to a Google Drive owned by me. I am not sending you to anywhere nefarious but that is a downloadable Word document that is a checklist that you can update and modify for your organization. So things to consider in that checklist, it's, it's in this checklist, who are you contacting first? When you get notified of, of an emergency, who's the first person you call? What's the first thing you ask? Where would you look for information first? Where would you post information first? Having a checklist like this helps you organize your brain. You don't have to remember everything because everybody else knows exactly what's been done. You can delegate tasks if you need to, and then you can check out what's been accomplished. And if someone asks you, well, what did you do? You can present them this document and say, hey, here's what we did. Here's who we talked to. Here's the information we found. Here's where we looked. And it's a real documented process for what you're doing. Now, you can adapt this to match your crisis plans, your agency procedures, because again, this is pretty generic and it's just based on what I have done in the past in my emergencies. But I recommend also testing and updating this checklist once a year or so in maybe a low-stress tabletop exercise or a team meeting, because you want to make sure those processes are accurate. Accurate. You want to make sure people on your team, especially if you've added new people or positions have shifted, know what their responsibilities are. And if you have had a training recently, or you've had a real event recently, it might be good to look at that emergency through the lens of this checklist to say, okay, did we do all of these things? Did we do something differently that was really effective that we want to add in <clears throat> so we can replicate it for next time? <clears throat> anyway, that link is right there in the chat. The next helpful tool is a repository of hopefully pre-approved by your approving authority holding statements. And holding statements are what we say when you know something has happened, but not much more. So a holding statement I used a couple of years ago was, Kamano Island Fire and Rescue can confirm that the abandoned sailboat at Farnham Point is on fire and firefighters are responding. As we get more information, we will post it here on Facebook and on our website, www.kamanofire.com. That is a holding statement. You now know what I know, right? 
These are real fill in the blank style statements that tell people what you know, even if you don't know a lot. You're filling that information void by saying, hi, we're the trusted resource. We know what's going on. This is where you want to come for more information because you're going to be the first to hear it right here. And like I said previously, many of you may have holding statements that you don't even know you have because it's what you've posted in the past during past emergencies. So look back to see what you have. Uh, look back at maybe old news releases, old emergency posts, old emergency alerts. Those can really serve as a jumping off point for documenting future holding statements for use. I'm going to throw another link in the chat because I have a large document full of holding statements. Some may be applicable to you. Some may not. That is okay. Use what you need. Ignore everything else. But based on what you already know about the risks in your area, you guys are very articulate about saying, hey, we know what our risks are. Adapt and customize these to what's going to work for you. And the goal is to have this entire document, short or long, pre-approved by whoever, according to your crisis plan, has that approving authority. <clears throat> then you can use them in that first hour of a crisis. The other thing you can do along with these holding statements is create some standard pre-approved graphics to go along with them. Because you may not, in the first hour, have a picture of what's going on or video of what's going on, but you can create some breaking news graphics or alert graphics that are standard that can maybe go with weather emergencies or road closures or flooding or tornadoes that you can put up. And having those graphics pre-approved and included along with those holding statements means if you get notification that something has gone wrong, according to your crisis plans, you will delegate, do what you need to do, but you'll also be able to literally copy and paste some content onto your website, onto your social platforms, accompany it with a graphic, go one step further, even have copy and paste alt text that goes with those graphics. And rather than spending time typing something up and creating a graphic in Canva and thinking about what you want to put for alt text, you're literally upload, copy, paste, copy, paste out the door, maybe 15 seconds, right? This is going to really save you a little bit of time and also give your leadership some proof that you are really thinking critically <clears throat> and strategically about what you want to do in an emergency, how you want to respond, how you want to position your agency as a trusted resource, and you've done the work to make sure that that's going to happen. And now, last but not least, training, right? Plans, holding statements, checklists are all really, really helpful but what brings it together is training, because we could talk for 20 more minutes. We could talk for three more hours. But what's important is doing it, because you wouldn't run a 10K without doing training, would you? I mean, maybe you would. I I probably would. But I know I would be a little sore, a little reflective, knowing that I can do it. But if I did it again, I'd probably do it a little bit differently. Right. So emergency communication is very much like training for a marathon. You are a communications professional, so you have the skills you need. But crisis communication is muscle memory. So the more you practice, even in small amounts, 30 minutes to an hour at a time, the more quickly and effectively you're going to be able to respond when a crisis hits. So training helps you do that. And there are a few resources that can help you get better and practice. One is Argonne National Labs, our uh, Public Affairs Science and Technology Fusion Academy. That's actually a picture from a class we did a couple of years ago in Pueblo, Colorado. We have PIO, we have spokespersons, social media classes geared towards state and federal agencies, specifically those working with or near chemical or nuclear facilities. We can give you that training and practice. FEMA's basic and advanced PIO courses are also great for building and refining your skills. They have virtual classes, they have local deliveries, or you can go and take classes at EMI where you put to practice, how do we create talking points? How are we going to run a press conference? It's really helpful. They also have a master PIO program that really helps you test your skills and kind of do that deep strategic dive into why we do what we do and why is it effective <clears throat> and how can we do it even better. <clears throat> and Dave just dropped in the chat, there is an Argonne class coming up in Frankfurt in March. Registration is opening soon. So bear that in mind. And then the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Their classes are social media focused typically, but it's social media for crisis communications that draws on a lot of those communications best practices. We have a tools and techniques and an engagement strategies course. They have recently been revised and updated as of literally two months ago. So they're about as up-to-date as we can get given how quickly social media changes. 
and they are going to be bringing a social media engage social media engagement strategies course to Highland Heights on May 7th. So know that that's coming. <clears throat> you can also stay current on crises because for better or for worse, something is usually always going wrong. So watch the news, you can scan YouTube, look at press conferences, and then do a little evaluation. What do you think went well in that press conference or in that crisis response? Is that something you can replicate for your own agency? Can you add it to your crisis plan? What could have been better? What did maybe they do not so well that you want to avoid? And can you add that to your crisis plans? But whatever you do, I think it's important to report back to your leadership, whether that's your boss or your boss's boss or your boss's boss's boss, on what you're doing, what you've learned, how you can apply it to improve what the agency does, because that'll help benefit your agency reputation and it'll help build more trust between you and your leadership that you know what you're doing in a crisis and they don't really need to step in and do anything. The other thing that's important, and it's something you can do closer to home without signing up for any of these outside classes, is working with your emergency management partners or your first responders to get your communications team, even if you're a team of one, into those existing trainings. Because we know, in general, your agency trains on an annual basis. It might be something simple like, like a tabletop exercise where you're just sitting around a table and talking through how you'd respond to a scenario, or it might be a drill testing one aspect of an emergency plan or a full-scale exercise. The problem is that most first responder agencies and most emergency managers, you might be lucky in your area. I don't know. I'm speaking from my own experience. Typically, these agencies don't advertise their trainings and they don't give communications a heads up. So it's important to be that squeaky wheel and say, hey, I see you're doing training. I would like to participate. And one example I will give you for why it's important is Dave mentioned in my bio that I responded to a shooting, a couple of shootings. Well, the agency I worked for set up a full-scale active shooter drill at our local community college. It is on a main street. It is really public. It is hard to miss. And they set this full-scale exercise up where ambulances would be going in and out. People would be in moulage. And they did it six months after the actual active shooter incident. And I was told as the communications director that not only did I not need to be there for the drill, I did not need to alert the public and media what was going on. That to me seemed very silly. So I had a rather delicate, choose your word, conversation with our emergency management division. And the next thing you know, hey, we used this as an opportunity to do outreach to the media and the public to let them know what was coming up and for the college to test their entire gist chick plan for how they would respond and notify during an emergency. My point is that you need to advocate for yourself, for your communications department, no matter what people tell you when you want to participate, because the PIO is part of the command staff. That means you always need to have a seat at the table and your job deserves just as much respect as the person running the incident. So even if when you say, hey, I see that you have training coming up, can I be a part? If you are told, oh, we've already planned it out, and we can't add a new player or communications doesn't need to be there, you can say, politely, I disagree. Here's what I need to do. I don't need to be a part of your drill. I don't need to be included in this. All I need is access to the exercise organizer or an access to your situation manual. Because the easier you make it on the person running the exercise, the more likely they are to say yes. So at the local level, I know my fire department does rope rescue training twice a year. I could easily go out, bring my local PIO network and say, hey, we're going to pretend like this is a real scenario where someone has fallen over the bluff. We're going to figure out what we need to do to take pictures, get them approved and craft three social media messages to go out on our Facebook and X profiles in 45 minutes. Can we do it? So you just need exercise facilitator access, the scenario access, and an idea of what part of your communications plan you want to test. That makes it super easy on the person running the exercise is there might just be one person who says, hey, can you show me that? Great, boom, and you're out the door. You can also think a little bit more broadly. What about your partner agencies? If your agency isn't doing something or doing something soon enough, what about your partner agencies? Local cities, local towns, counties, municipalities, colleges and universities, your Emergency management partners may know what's going on in the community because they may be participating in those trainings, so ask them. 
Again, ask if you can be included. Ask if that agency's communications department is already participating. If they are, great. See if you can make that contact and either watch or participate on your own and just repeat those same steps. Hey, can I be included? Great, all I need is access to the exercise facilitator and access to any of the scenarios you've created. Great, here's the part of our communications plan we're gonna test. If that doesn't work, think even more broadly, regionally, county, regional response groups. Hey, what are you guys doing for a test? Can we be included? Is the communications department already participating? And then rinse and repeat. And if all else fails, honestly, you can do it yourself. It is not hard to come up with your own training to figure out, hey, does our plan work? What do we need to change? What do we need to update? All you need is a scenario. Let's call it a train crash. Maybe some injects. Well, the train derailed and there was a unknown substance in one of the cars that's now leaking. We've had to shut down some streets. We've had to do some evacuations. Boom, you've got yourself a scenario. And you can play that out sitting around a table, having some of your partner agencies discuss, all right, well, who would be responsible for shutting down the roads? Oh, would that be public works? Would that be sheriff? Okay, well, how would I get notified if I'm the communications person? Okay, well, what would you want me to tell people? How would you want me to put that out? Well, would you want me to use the sheriff's office? Social media pages, is that something we do as the county? Like, how would we coordinate that? That right there, boom, that's a scenario that you can talk through. You could also do a more specific timed exercise where you say, okay, we have all this information. We know what our roles and responsibilities are. Let's see how long it takes us to craft a news release, three social media posts, and an update for our emergency information page and get those approved and published. No matter what you do, it's important to document what you learned, what went well, what you want to improve, and then update those plans and processes accordingly and tell your leadership, hey, we did this great communications drill. I just wanted to let you know we're a lot more prepared and ready to respond to an emergency because we just went through this and updated three things in our crisis communications plan. Advocate for yourself, train, build that muscle memory so that when the crisis happens, you're going to be a lot more prepared to respond to it. It comes back to that original point is that success during a crisis happens before the crisis ever happens. So I know that was a lot of talking. I know that was a lot of things to consider. Once again, this is on YouTube or will be, so you can go back and rewatch it. But I'm going to drop the link in the chat, or you can use your phone to scan the QR code on the screen. And just tell me, do you feel a little bit more confident now that you know what to do first? We'll give it about 30 seconds or so for you to click that link or scan that QR code. <clears throat> Give it about 10 more seconds. I got a little countdown clock here. So for more you want to click and tell me what you think, we'll share those results here in a second. All right, look at that. So just for, for reference, this is where we started. Kind of, eh, not sure. And this is where we are now. I would say that's pretty good improvement, wouldn't you? Obviously, training, practice, that's really going to solidify it in your brains. But I am glad that you found this helpful and useful. So with that, I am going to uh, ask if you have any questions. Again, this is our Public Affairs Science and Technology Fusion Academy. That's how you get in touch with us. It's pastfusion.anl.gov or pastfusion at anl.gov. Take a screen grab of that if you are interested in training. And I'll turn it back over to David because, as he mentioned, we do have a Argon class coming up at the end of March. So thank you all for being attentive over your lunch break or after your lunch break. I appreciate it. Dave, take it away. I'm going to stop my screen share. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I did want to go back. Uh, I had a couple of comments that ended up getting sent directly to me that said the holding statements were great. Um, and I did have one person 
Uh, I think this was when we were talking about the approval process for like posting social mm -hmm. media. What if that person is busy and gets held up longer than you'd like? Yeah. And I think that's part of the conversation you have to have in an emergency. You want to make sure that whoever needs to approve your messaging knows of the urgency and immediacy of social media. Um, I, I have very much been in the situation where somebody said, well, I'm in a meeting for 10 more minutes. And I said, it's not going to wait 10 more minutes. But I had developed that relationship and that trust with the person that when I said I need it now, I needed it now and I had a good reason. So either making sure the person who needs to approve your messages isn't going to be so busy they can't do it at all, or making sure that person can delegate approval authority to somebody who maybe isn't as busy, understanding why it's urgent and why you need to get it out. And as John just dropped in the chat, 90% of the time, especially if they're holding statements, you can have those pre-approved so that you can plunk in the date and the location, and it doesn't even need approval because the message itself is ready to go. That help? Absolutely, excellent. Does anybody else have any other questions for Bronley? I'm here, y'all got eight more minutes. You could put it in chat, feel free to unmute yourself, ask it in person. All right, well, while they're thinking, I'm gonna share a couple of things. If you have a question, please don't hesitate. Uh, so share my screen here. Um, so you all have my communicate or my information. Contact me anytime about anything. Uh, she mentioned uh, the, the guidance that we have. We have templates. We also do exercise and training. So if you want to participate, we have a whole training department. If it's emergency management related, we can get connected with them and it's possible we can fulfill a request that you have. Um, we also activate regularly uh, here in Frankfurt at the State Emergency Operations Center and are always looking for people uh, to man those stations if you want to come in and actually work during a disaster. So feel free, any questions, contact me anytime. Um, upcoming webinar schedule. Uh, as I mentioned, we have through August already booked. Um, March registration is open. If you go to that registration site uh, under choose class, if you do the drop down menu, uh, I know it's kind of awkward. The March 20th date is there. It says, I believe it's called, I don't remember if I put it smartphone video or live streaming, um, but uh, we have an excellent speaker. He's going to talk about online video and its critical communication tool during a crisis. Um, they're going to talk. He's going to teach you the basics on how to use smartphone video effectively during an emergency. He's going to cover how to make quick turnaround recorded videos, how to do effective live stream broadcasts. Um, this includes how to prepare, how to title live streams, how to avoid co viewer confusion, uh, key elements to include in an update. Uh, how to engage viewers, uh, how to constantly deliver your message on camera. I'm looking forward to this. This sounds excellent. Um, and I will send out, following this uh, webinar, when I get the video all set, I'll send out link to register. I'll send out update for all of the topics we have scheduled. Uh, oh, there's our topic or our speaker for uh, March, Carrie Shearer, the live stream expert. Um, I am planning a couple of trainings. We are going to have a public information basics class that is a full three days, 24-hour class going to be held here in Frankfurt. Um, there is one prerequisite for that. Um, it is uh, a PIO base, uh, um, IS-29 uh, public information um, if any of that sounds foreign to you, feel free to contact me. I'll have the information on how to take that class. It's an online class, a short class uh, prior to it in the announcement. Um, Bronley mentioned, Bronley is coming to visit us in Kentucky. Uh, the date on this is May 7th, and she will be doing a PER 343 class, which is Social Media Engagement Strategies. If you want to pipe in on this, Bronley, please do. I know that there is a prerequisite. Or yeah, it's more of a, it's more of a recommendation. Um, most of us have done, there used to be a prerequisite 10 years ago when social media was newish. 
but now we have, uh, there's a web-based PER 304 awareness training that you can take if you want to, you don't have to, we will not, not let you take the course if you haven't taken it, but the engagement strategies course really talks about the why behind social media. It's about why are we doing this and why is this effective and why are you reaching this audience? And then what can you learn from your data to help refine what you're doing in the future? So it is, it's, it's a thinking heavy class, but like this one, hopefully you will leave with some great ideas for what you can change and improve to make your social media more engaging to your community. Excellent. I will personally be attending that class. So, uh, I, again, once I send out all the follow-up from this webinar, I'll have a link in there where you, if you want to go, you can register for it. It'll be in Northern Kentucky at the Campbell County Fire Training Center. Um, and I know there are lots of seats available to it. Yep. And Brett just noticed, uh, dropped in the chat, uh, Brett works with us at Argonne. He is my boss at Argonne. Um, I will be actually physically, apparently, in Kentucky uh, in a month and then in May. So you will see me again. Hopefully that's good. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Excellent. Um, uh, and then there is one more we mentioned uh, just briefly, and I don't have any information on this yet, but we are going to do a risk communicate, a risk and crisis communication methodology and strategy course here in Frankfurt again. Uh, this is going to be the end of March as soon as I get the training announcement and registration open for that, I will uh, I will make sure you guys all have it. All right, any other questions? Anything for Bronley? Again, Bronley, thank you so much. It was an excellent webinar. Appreciate yeah. all the information. Appreciate Carla, all the I'm documents trying to you, you shared. I'm trying to give Carla full links because I know some of, some of your agencies do not like link shorteners. I fully understand that. So I'm just grabbing the full links so that your IT department doesn't hate you. And I have grabbed those. So I will make sure people have access to them one way or the other as well. Okay, there you go. There's both of them. If your agency doesn't like Google Drive, um, just let David know, he can email me and I will give you like literally the actual Word document. All right. If there are no other questions for Ron Lee, I thank everybody. Uh, I'm, I hope you learned something. Hope it was good. Uh, feel free to shoot me feedback on any of these events that we do anytime. And I look forward to uh, seeing you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Ron everybody. Lee. Appreciate so much. You're welcome. Thanks, y'all.